Hello, my name is Simon Mills. I'm a lecturer in early modern history at Newcastle University, and I'm very pleased that my book, uh, Commerce of Knowledge, Trade, Religion and Scholarship between England and the Ottoman Empire circa 1600 to 1760 has been shortlisted for the Royal Historical Society's Gladstone Prize. The book begins with a letter written in the year 1674 by an English Hebrew scholar called John Lightfoot. He's writing to a friend in Oxford, Edward Bernard, about a shared interest in the literature of the Samaritans, the Jewish sect referred to in the New Testament parable. And in the course of this letter, Lightfoot mentions another friend of Bernard's, a young cleric called Robert Huntington, whom Lightfoot says he envies for the ocular view which Huntington then had of those places, as he puts it, in the land of Canaan. Robert Huntington had left England three years or so earlier for the city of Aleppo in Ottoman Syria, where he was to serve for a decade as chaplain to the English merchants then employed in the Levant trade. I began in this way because this vignette, a cleric and scholar in 17th century England thinking about one of his contemporaries in Ottoman Syria and Palestine was a way into the two themes which I wanted to explore in the book. On the one hand, English intellectual life in the 17th and 18th centuries, in particular, what were called at the time Oriental studies. And on the other hand, the expansion of English commercial and diplomatic interests in the Ottoman Empire. As a graduate student, I'd read Gerald Toomer's book on the history of Arabic studies in the 17th century, alongside the work of historians of science, Harold Cook, Simon Schaffer, Stephen Harris, and others, who were thinking about how the influx of materials and information in the wake of commercial, missionary, and colonial initiatives overseas had served as a stimulus to scientific development. I wanted to ask how humanist scholarship might also have been bound up with the history of international trade, not so much because scholars were influenced particularly by commercial interests, but more because the presence of men like Robert Huntington in the Ottoman Empire made possible the collecting of manuscripts and antiquities, contact with local scholars, and as John Lightfoot recognized, the first-hand observation of the vestiges of the world described in the Bible. Why do this? Well, firstly, because thinking about English scholarship in relation to the 17th century Levant trade was a way of placing the story of what happened in England into a broader European context. Several historians have written very well about the so-called confessional aspects of early modern scholarship, whereby competition between churches across Catholic and Protestant Europe was a spur to new forms of historical scholarship. What a commerce of knowledge tries to show is that this was connected to the presence of the different European merchant communities across North Africa and the Middle East. Huntington, as I depict him and other chaplains in the book, is often in fierce competition, but sometimes in perhaps unexpected ways in collaboration with rival French, Italian or Dutch collectors. Secondly, writing about the history of English scholarship, not as it looked from Oxford or Cambridge, but from Ottoman Syria, meant that I was able to pay more attention to those Jewish, Christian and Muslim interlocutors with whom Huntington and other chaplains came into contact. Another aspect of Huntington and other chaplains' careers, which I tried to reconstruct, is their correspondence and indeed their friendships with Jewish and Samaritan, Eastern Christian and Muslim scribes, scholars and brokers. And I tried to argue, ultimately, that these figures had more of a role than previously has been assigned to them in shaping the course of English scholarship. Most of the action of the book plays out from the city of Aleppo, which was then an important commercial centre, and I cover broadly three different topics, the trade in manuscripts, the collecting and study of antiquities, including the story of an early expedition to Palmyra, and lastly, the English attempt to print and to disseminate books in Arabic among the Christians of the Ottoman Empire. Thinking about trade and scholarship in their relation to one another, also provided me with a structure for the book chronologically. In the final chapter, I argue that a shift in English commercial 
and diplomatic interests away from the Middle East to India, coincided with new intellectual projects, again, not because scholars were influenced by the concerns of trade or particularly of empire, but because the presence of English merchants, administrators and chaplains in East Asia was an opportunity to acquire new forms of knowledge. <laughs> 